for your glory, dear Jesus. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'd like to invite the kids to come on up and help me with the children's message this morning. So, kids, yeah, there's a good bunch of you. It seems like everybody's sitting on that side. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Do you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, what was your, what was your favorite part of Thanksgiving? The turkey and mashed potatoes. Okay, yeah, what about you? Being with your family, yeah. Some maybe you haven't seen in a while. Yeah, yeah. What else? What are some other your, yeah. Um, like, like sharing your toys. Sharing your toys, okay, with some, some other kids at your house, yeah. Watching football. Watching football, okay, and then falling on, asleep on the sofa, right? Yeah, just like, just like the pilgrims did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, now that Thanksgiving o is over, um, there is another holiday that's coming pretty soon. Christmas. What, what? Christmas. Christmas is coming? I, I'm thankful for sister. Yeah. I'm thankful for my sister. You're thankful for your sister? Awesome. Well, that is so cute. So, you mean you're never mean to your sister? Never, never. Does he mean to you ever? No? Good. Awesome. So, so what? But, so Christmas is coming. How do you know Christmas is coming pretty soon? Because, um, Jesus was born? Because Jesus was born? Yeah, but, but how do we know Christmas is almost here? Yeah. Because it's snowing. Okay, because it's cold and we're getting some snow. Yeah, we're supposed to get a lot of snow, I hear, but I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, Ben, would you... Because it's almost your birthday. When's your birthday? December 15th, yeah. And you're 21st? December 21st? Mine's the last day. Whoa. <laughs> what? what? My sister's birthday is March 25th. Oh, okay. No, great. Mine's April 12th, so. What? What? <laughs> Um, and my birthday sometimes on Easter, but you know, we're getting way off track. Okay, so how are some other, I just, you know, you never know, you just lose control. Um, what, what are some other signs Christmas is almost here? Huh? Yeah. And I presents. Pro, oh, yeah, we'll get lots of presents. My, what about, radio, what about songs? You, do you hear Christmas songs yet? Yes. On the radio, and yes. has anybody put Christmas decorations up at home I yet? Put, I put my tree at uh, Christmas, yeah. You saw uh, decorations on a house. Yeah, so we see the decorations on the house. We hear the Christmas music. So there's signs that Christmas is coming pretty soon. Well, you know what? 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born, you know, there was no newspapers or radio. And the snow snow's covered everything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so um, 2,000 years ago, there wasn't anything um, to tell us that a Savior had been born, that Jesus was here. And you know, in fact, when, when Jesus was born, very few people knew that he was the Savior. And so, but you know what? Um, many people, have, of course, had been looking forward to Jesus' birth for a long, long time. Because God had promised it a long, long time before Jesus was born. They knew a Savior was coming, but they just didn't know when. Well, you know, this Sunday marks the uh, first, this coming Sunday, next Sunday, uh, marks the beginning of a brand new church here in a season called Advent. Does anybody know what Advent means? Advent? It, it means coming. Santa will bring presents. That's right. He will. Why don't you just sit right here, okay? So, do you want to? You know, okay. well, anyway. Yeah, so, so we knew. I don't know. Where was I? Okay. Santa. Okay. okay Santa. Okay. Um, they knew that a Savior was coming, but they just didn't know when. But now, 
Next Sunday begins Advent. Advent is a season that means coming, okay? So we're, something important is coming. Christmas is coming, of course. But we're also looking forward to the time when Jesus comes again. Did you guys know that Jesus was coming again? Yes. You did? Yeah. And you know what? No, Just as when Jesus was born the first time, and, um, and, and came the first time, there were certain signs that, that he, when he comes again. That and there Jesus are no, gets stuck in the well in his numbers in his ears. What? The Jesus got stuck in the well in his numbers in his ears. Jesus got stuck in something. That's what I make, make, make out of that. But, but Jesus is coming again, and you know what? There are signs that he's coming again. So, like, all of the bad stuff we see in the world that's happening is just a, a reminder that Jesus is coming again. And you guys look forward to seeing Jesus? Yeah. I do, too. All right, well, why don't we say, why don't we say a prayer, okay? Something about Jesus we're looking through binoculars. That's what I get. It's okay. All right, let's pray. You want to want to pray with us? We'll pray. Can you fold your hands and we're going to say a prayer, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season and what it means to us. We thank you for keeping your promise to send us a Savior. And we thank you for the promise that he will come again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for your help. You were a big boy today. There you go. All right. Be careful as you go back to your seats. Okay, he's taking the long way home. <laughs> You just never know what kind of trouble you're going to get into when you sit down with those kids. I'll tell you. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes on earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Repent. The end is near. Judgment day is at hand. We've all seen folks standing with signs like those at, at one time or another, I think. Signs meant to frighten people into repentance. And frighten people, they may. But the fact is that fear never drew people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed, most people, even Christians, uh, often dismiss those who carry such signs as lunatics or as best, at best overzealous fanatics bent on using fear tactics to scare people into the kingdom of God. And one has to wonder if they've ever had any success. Well, however that may be, the fact is that Jesus is coming, as each of our readings today attests. But for us, his beloved children, the fact that Jesus will one day return should inspire not fear, but great joy. It means that we will be delivered from this broken world of sin and death. And it means that we will be reunited with loved ones who have long since gone home to be with the Lord. And what a day that will be. No more weeping. No more sickness. No more hate or violence or war. No more voter recounts. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is coming. And when that long-awaited day does come, as far as I'm concerned, it will be none too soon. Today is the last Sunday of the church year. The long season of Pentecost is at last coming to an end. Next Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, we begin a brand new church year. A time when we focus 
especially on the first coming of Jesus and what that event means to the world. But today, and to a lesser degree during Advent as well, we also look to the second Advent of Christ. That day when he will return in all his glory and take his people home. If we truly have no reason to fear Christ's return, if the fear of the coming judgment of this world does not draw people to Jesus, why, you may wonder, do so many scripture passages speak of that day with horror? Listen to this. This is from Zephaniah 1. There the Lord speaking through the prophet declares, A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring, bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. That sounds absolutely terrifying. And it should. Though scripture is clear that no one knows the day or the hour, it is coming. And we're certainly closer to that day than ever before. The signs of its coming are everywhere. Fires, floods, hurricanes, global warming, wars and rumors of wars, persecution of our fellow believers. People may argue now who Jesus really is. If he is truly God. If the Bible is true. But on that day, there will be no doubt. On that day, Scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. But unfortunately, for many on that day, it will be too late. On that day, those who have chosen to go their own way and rejected God's way will be consigned to an eternity of suffering, a misery that will never end. On that day, there truly will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And sad to say, that will include people from every nation on earth. And some will be people that you and I know quite well. That's the bad news. But friends, here's the good news. The great news. God does not want that for anyone. Not one. He didn't even want it for those who pierced him. Remember, even as they were driving the spikes into his hands and feet, Jesus was speaking the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That is God's radical, unimaginable love. The Lord loves each of us equally. He created us. Every one of us with intention. He has a plan laid out for each of our lives. Plans to glorify his name through us. But from the time sin first entered the world through Adam and Eve, mankind has continually rejected God's plan. And to a greater or lesser degree, we all have rejected the Lord. We do so every time we sin. And for that reason, we deserve nothing but eternal condemnation and death. That sin that Adam and Eve unleashed on the world has infected us all. It's become part of our DNA. I don't think it'll show up on your 23andMe test, but the result is that we're corrupt from the moment we are conceived. Not only has that sin corrupted us, but it's affected God's once perfect creation as well. It not only brought physical and eternal death to mankind, it brought death to the animal kingdom as well. It brought floods, famine, pestilence, and plagues. It brought hurricanes, tornadoes, tidal waves, and drought. It brought the recent fires that have killed hundreds and perhaps even over a thousand in California. 
in the Florida hurricane that wiped entire communities off the map. All of these things are signs that the end is near. Even in the beginning, even before the beginning, God knew that all of this was going to happen, that we would ruin the beautiful world that he created for us, that we, whom he created in his image, would come to despise him, and instead we would worship things made with our own hands. And yet he created us anyway, knowing what it would cost him. He didn't have to create us. Or he could have at least left us in our broken, condemned condition. He could have wiped creation out and said, that's enough. But he didn't. Why? Because of his radical love for us. And so rather than consign us to an eternity of suffering, he sent his son, Jesus, to suffer in our place. So great is our Heavenly Father's love for us, for all of us, that he sent his son Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not, to bear the full brunt of his wrath for our sins in the most torturous death imaginable, even to suffer the agonies of hell for us when God forsook him on the cross. And then God did the unimaginable. He raised Jesus from the dead. And the result is that instead of spending an eternity in hell, where Scripture says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, we will now spend an eternity with Jesus in the new creation and with all who have received faith in the Lord. Who could ever imagine a love like that? You can't. It's unfathomable. I mean, sure, there isn't a parent here who wouldn't willingly suffer for their children. But would you do that for, for those who hate you? Probably not. Jesus did. Jesus did because our Heavenly Father doesn't want anyone to suffer the kind of everlasting torment the Scriptures describe. And so he did the unthinkable and sent us his Son instead. We can't even imagine how it must pain the Lord when his beloved children reject him to go their own way. But you know, you can almost hear that anguish in, in Jesus' voice as he lamented to the leaders of Israel who rejected him and then later nailed him to a tree. Listen. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? But you were not willing. Yes, Jesus died for them too, just as he died for me and you. Brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father has done what was unimaginable, even unthinkable, so that no one has to suffer the horrors of hell. In what's called the Great Exchange, Jesus took what was ours, our sin, our shame, our punishment. He took it all onto himself and he gave us what was uniquely his. His holiness, his righteousness, and the eternal life, and all of the treasures of heaven that go along with it. There has never been a love so great, or a gift so precious as the one that we have in Christ. What good news that is for us and for the entire world. If you've been baptized that promise of salvation is yours forever. In that precious event, God put his holy name on you. And he made you his own dear child forever. 
And he continually renews that promise by giving you more and more of his grace whenever you hear his words of absolution, whenever you receive his supper. And that way he keeps you close to his side. Brothers and sisters, as God's beloved children, we have no reason to fear our Lord's return. On the contrary, we have much to which we can look forward. Not only is that God's promise to us, it's a gift that we can share with the world as well. And as people who know the truth, we should be desperate to share the love of Christ with others, that they too may be spared in the end. And I can't help but think of John Chow. Maybe you read of him recently in the news. He's a young man who was recently killed when trying to share the gospel to the Sentinelese tribe on a remote island off of India. Shortly before his death, John wrote these words in his diary. Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had the chance to hear your name? And then noting that it was very likely that he could be killed, he recorded this prayer. Lord, I think I could be more useful alive, but to you, God, I give all the glory of whatever happens. And finally, he asked God to forgive any of the people on this island who try to kill me, especially if they succeed. The unconditional, sacrificial love of Jesus will stop at nothing to save his people from destruction. Maybe you have a desire to share Jesus with others. Maybe you just don't know how. And if that's the case, I would invite you to join us for a 945 Bible study on Everyone His Witness, which begins January 20th. And that study will show us how to share the joy of the gospel in a natural way comfortable way. Because, my friends, the end is near. Jesus is coming. And to that we pray with the whole church on earth. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen.